Good morning, fellow Drinking Mommies. I'm Whitney, one of the co-founders of the group Drinking Mommies. You are listening to our very first flagship broadcast where we are going to be talking about a rather controversial topic, which is going to be motherhood and sexuality. Joining me today, I have Kate calling in from Massachusetts. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, the single mom of the group. I've got two beautiful girls. We're living up in freezing cold Massachusetts right now. So I'm going to bring a nice little perspective to this discussion of being a single mom and trying to date. We also have Katie calling us from the great state of Hawaii. Hello, I am a kind of working mom, um, military spouse, and pretty much enjoying life in paradise. And been with my husband for 18 years, so sex drive is always a fun topic. Oh, indeed it is. Next, we have Nikki calling us from California. Hi, I'm Nicole. Um, I'm a mom of three girls. I'm a stay-at-home mom. Uh, me and my husband actually live out in the desert in the middle of nowhere, out in California. Um, let's see, I'm a fire wife, firefighter wife, and yeah, I don't know what else to say. So, you're an important person, Nikki. You own that. And then, lastly, <laughs> we have our guest co-host for tonight, Lisa Bruce, who's calling us from my home state of Washington. Hi, my name is Lisa and I own Lisa J. Bruce Photography. I'm a boudoir photographer and I specialize in boudoir. Um, I also have three kids, a boy and two girls. And I've also been with my husband about 18 years. So, oh, 19 years. So um, yeah, sex is a hot topic. Um, every woman who comes into the studio, we end up talking about sex. So. I got lots of stories and lots of perspectives, and I'm excited to be here with you guys. We are really excited to have you here with us, Lisa. So it's funny how this topic actually came to be. About two weeks ago, we were approached by a company that most of you probably know of as being the adult toy store conglomerate known as Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve first reached out to us, they said, hey, we're interested in a partnership for us, we want to go about doing something that's tasteful, that's geared towards moms. If you'd like to know more, please get back to us. And I reached out, not knowing exactly where this topic was going to go, but honestly, I was uh, curious, not going to lie. And after speaking to one of their marketing representatives, we came to find that Adam and Eve was looking at getting more moms to join in to a big marketing campaign to empower them to feel confident about their bodies as well as to get them of course to buy the merchandise as they are in the adult store and lingerie at my after, you know after all and um i went back to the girls from drinking mommies and said hey look are you guys interested in joining in into this partnership and honestly, that's where we came to the conclusion that motherhood and sexuality isn't a topic that really gets discussed. And in fact, there's often a negative taboo that goes along with sexuality being sexy and having sex while being a mom. Apparently, for some reason, that just ends once you start popping out kids. So here we are today approaching a brand new marketing campaign with a company that um, is known around the world for <laughs> selling sex toys and lingerie. And I'm pretty excited about it. So we're gonna start the conversation with some round table discussion. And first of all, I would like to go to Kate. So how do you feel you have grown as a woman in your sexuality from being a single post, you know, pre-mom to after motherhood? Uh, you know, it's actually been very, uh, a very interesting road for me because um, I dated a lot in high school and then got married to a guy I barely knew uh, when I was 19 years old. Um, 
And so things were just crazy then. And, you know, everything was just so fun. Um, and then I became a mother. Um, I was that girl in high school that was like 90 pounds soaking wet with like 10 pounds of change in my pocket. And then when I got pregnant with my first daughter, um, I put on about 80 pounds. I just absolutely loved Chick-fil-A during my pregnancy. That was all I wanted, Chick-fil-A and Taco Bell. Um, so the body changes that I went through um, absolutely destroyed my self-confidence. And then um, I ended up getting divorced, um, met my second husband. Things were great. Got divorced again. And you know, had a daughter with my second husband and again, I put on a bunch of weight. So, so the body image issue is a huge thing for me. Especially now that I'm, my kids are 12 and eight and I'm still not back down to pre-pregnancy body um, And I'm trying to date. The, the dating pool is insane right now. I have some really steep competition. Well, and it's hard too, you know, um, when you're established in marriage, like I've been married for going on 11 years now in January, um, I'm not out there in the dating game. Anymore. Oh, it's, it's atrocious right now. Um, I mean, just especially with all of the um, Instagram models that are out there, it just can wreak havoc on your self-esteem because all of these women are out there in bikinis and crop tops and tiny little shorts and I'm sitting here in big baggy sweaters because I just don't like my body right now or I didn't like my body right so it was very it was very difficult to get anybody to even approach me or acknowledge me when I approached them so it was it was tough definitely now Katie what is your your perspective in all this no but i even think like we're saying you know the competition even being married you still feel like god like, i don't look like these girls that he might see on instagram can you hear me now yes we can hear you <laughs> um you know even like the insecurities even after being with somebody for 18 years you still have this like i don't look like i did before when i had the critter out there and now it's like, oh God, does he still find me attractive? Does he, am I, does he like the way I look? And I ask him all the time, like, am I, do I look okay? And of course he's a supportive husband. He's not going to be like, no, he says he would be honest and tell me. But I think that as a female, we all have that in the back of our mind. Like, shit, am I going to be fucking good enough for this guy? Is he going to stay with me for another 18 years? I get what you're saying. I can't imagine dating. I always and say, if he ever left me, I would never, one, I'm never dating or be getting married again ever like that <laughs> i know i'm one and done right now <laughs> yeah girl i ain't messing around people are like oh i'm gonna get remarried i might have a sugar daddy but i sure suck in not getting remarried right <laughs> so smart girl it is a smart girl so <laughs> nikki you just out of all of us you are the most recent one um mm -hmm who just had a baby. Yeah. How do you feel? Actually, this time has been really hard for me. Um, all my girls, I was pretty, pretty close to um, where I was before I had my first getting back. But, you know, I had stretch marks. Your body's not perfect afterwards. It happens, obviously. My second, I had more stretch marks, and it didn't really bother me, and I actually lost weight pretty quick um with her but then this one i gained a lot more she was almost nine pounds at birth um and i have so much so many stretch marks my stomach is i have extra skin on my stomach now um and it's i mean granted it's only been six months but it's been really frustrating and i think even because i i tore <laughs> way back down there this time <laughs> So I had to get a lot of stitches and I mean, people don't like talking about that, but that shit's real and it happens. Okay. So like, no, it is real. I had 11 stitches you know? after giving birth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 
can't remember how many I had. I probably like eight maybe, but still it's scary. And my husband didn't even want to tell me how many. And the doctor was like, oh, you, you just tore a little bit. Don't worry about it. But nope. Um, it was actually painful right. afterwards. So yeah, I don't know this time, like just because my body's not where I want it to be right now. It's been a lot more difficult. And plus it's baby number three. Like I have t other two little ones to keep up with and then her. <laughs> so yeah, this time it's been hard, harder, I guess. See, but that's also one of the other things as well, is when you have three little ones that you're chasing around, it's harder mm -hmm. to find time to do what you need to do, like hair appointments, working out. I just remember having one child for the mm -hmm. first two years of Gavin's life. It was next to impossible to get to the gym because mm -hmm. none of the gyms would let me bring a baby in there, even in a stroller or a pack and play, there was no yeah. uh, childcare available. And so it was very self-defeating for me to want to get back. Like I wanted to get back into shape, but I couldn't because there were limitations and being military family, like, you know, Katie, it's hard because when you don't have family there, you're just on your own. <laughs> and it, it doesn't help with body. Yeah. It doesn't help with body image. Now, with you, Lisa, you also have three little ones, like Nikki. Um, how, how do you feel from where you were prior to having kids to after having kids about your own self-image? Um, that's kind of a loaded question because my boudoir business has completely changed my, com my perspective on my body, women's bodies, how everybody feels about their body. Um, everybody who comes in, they, they have insecurities. And, and me learning that every single person has insecurities kind of normalizes it. And it actually makes me have a lot of confidence. And so while I have had three kids and I have um, definitely, I'm not where my body was before, but there is no, like, to me, there's no before, like you are where you're at because that's where you're at. And there's no going back. You have three kids. If you want to go back, that's erasing three children. Like it just isn't, it shouldn't even be your mentality at all. It should, it's all internal 100%. And, um, I had my own boudoir pictures taken this summer at the heaviest I've ever weighed. I fucking love them. They're like they my favorite them. pictures ever. Yeah, you've seen them. Um, yeah. So it's so, it's so mental. Everything is so mental that, um, I mean, every, even just listening to all of your guys' stories, it was like my heart wanted to like jump out of my chest because I wanted to start like preaching to each of you as to why you shouldn't feel the way that you were talking about feeling because that's just what I do and I love it. And it's so hard um, to... It, it's hard to get to that place, but I am there. I'm there where I, um, I don't want to go back. I don't want to be who I was before I had kids because this is where I'm at. And, um, I'm okay with that. Yeah, of course. I'd love to get to the gym more, but you know, same issues that anybody else is having with that. And you know, the best, you just have to do the best that you can do. And if that's, you know, going for a walk or whatever that makes you feel better, that's what you got to do. And I just choose not to stress about it at all. See, and I absolutely love that mentality. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's really important for women to go and make whatever gestures they need to do to make themselves feel more confident. Having the photographs taken, I think is a really important step because it shows a raw and vulnerable side of you that a lot of people don't get to see. Um, Lisa, for those of you that don't know, I know Lisa from many years back, way back in the Petco days. Yes, we worked at Petco. It was awesome. Um, but two summers ago, I had Lisa take my photos for her <laughs> door photography. And I'm not gonna lie, I was really insecure about it. Um, I 
had fallen off the CrossFit bandwagon for a while, so I wasn't as toned and as fit as I wanted to be. What? Okay, excuse me. Why are you guys in here? Okay. Parenting at its best here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's always a problem. Where's your sister? Um, but so we have an opportunity to go and get some photos taken. And I told Lisa, I'm like, you know, I'm really, really worried about. Um, I don't feel like I, I am I'm ready to have my photos taken. And she was amazing about making me feel comfortable, making me feel relaxed. And um, honestly, it was a very empowering experience. So for you, Lisa, um, you have photographed so many women, a lot of them moms. Yes. I am very curious to hear how you feel your work has gone to change the stigma around women who are mothers and reclaiming their sexuality, making them feel confident in their bodies, as well as, you know, changing the, the norm. We don't see moms in a sexual light, and if we do, it's usually negative, something to do with a MILF, or the person has loose morals and values, but what you do is truly art. So we would love to hear some of your experiences. Well, um, it's, so I was trying to think of how, how best to describe it, and, you know, a little bit more background on my business. Um, I have a boudoir studio. I have photographed over 200 women just this year. Um, so I see, I see a lot of women and not all moms, um, a lot of moms, but all ages, um, over 18. <laughs> and, um, it's hard because so many people come in and they're, they're so nervous. Everybody's nervous. Everybody messages me and says, I'm so nervous. Oh my God. I'm like, I'm going to throw up. Everybody does. And so I always tell them, I'm like you and everyone else, you'll be fine. Um, but then when they come in, I always, you know, I, obviously I have my, my business model in which I follow and I help get people prepared. But then once they come in, um, we talk, it's like, it's like the ultimate girl time. And so often the conversation does turn into talking about sex and talking about where they're at with it and how they feel about themselves. And a lot of times the secrets that come out are pretty common. It's very much so, um, a lot of times it's people who haven't been having sex with their partner, with their husbands, um, because they are, they do not like their body. There's a lot, a lot of that. And there's people, they're in my studio getting naked with me for pictures, but won't with their husband because they are so um, torn apart about the way that they look. And so a lot of times, you know, I, I just tell them, I'm like, they do not care. <laughs> like, they do not care if you gained 20 pounds, they want to have sex with you. Like, they don't care. And, and so we, we have a lot of sex talk, um, a lot of encouraging and, um, the session in general is amazing. I use professional hair and makeup artists. So people always look amazing and everybody loves their pictures. I have not had one single person come back and say they didn't like their pictures. And nine times out of 10 people will message me later and be like, Hey, guess what? We had sex, <laughs> you know, and they tell me, and, um, it's just, this becomes this whole relationship that is so far beyond just me taking pictures. Um, it is so, there's so much afterwards. I get messages forever from people telling me how much I changed their life, which is really weird because, um, I just feel so normal talking about all the things that I talk about and doing all the things that I do that it, it's kind of heartbreaking. I'm like, why isn't this more normal? Like, how am I affecting you so much? But it's true. I, I get messages every single day from people talking to me about how much it's changed them. Um, in my boudoir group alone, I get a lot of comments from people saying that they, it's like the most positive place that they have. Um, a lot of 
you know, that the, it's the place that they come to. My boudoir group is the place that they come to to share pictures and stories and whatnot because they don't have anywhere else to post them. And it's just super freaking empowering. And um, it really is. It, yeah, it's totally changed my life. And and it's changed a lot of people's lives. And another thing that I do, which I thought about a second ago with something somebody said about Instagram, there's a lot of people I follow on Instagram that I feel are really inspiring. Um, super sexy women who are, who are bigger. Um, Audrey Little is one of them. I fucking love her. She's super badass and she is thick and she wears two piece swimsuits and just does her thing. And I have a lot of women like that, that I follow. And I tell people, go follow these people and take those other people. And I'm not going to name names, but you know who I'm talking about. Take those other people off your Instagram. You don't need to follow them if they're making you feel bad about yourself. Well, and that's a really important part to bring up because you are normalizing what the human body looks like. And let's be real. A lot of what we see on Instagram is a filtered life, not just because it's literal filters, you know, that people are using. It's very selective. And that's one of the reasons why we founded Drinking Moms is because there's been an unrealistic expectation on motherhood as well. Everything has to be Pinterest perfect all the time. And that's why I absolutely love this conversation that we're having right now, because we don't talk about the body. My body is not the same post having Gavin. I, every day, I look at my body and it's like, I have stretch marks in places that I didn't have prior. Um, my skin on my stomach is looser. And those are things, you know, they said there's insecurities in the back of my mind, but I'm not going to lie. There's been moments, like I said, almost 11 years of marriage where I have felt so unsexy that it has literally interfered with my sex life with my husband. Um, there was one point where I went almost three months without having an intimate relationship with him. Not because I didn't find him attractive, not because I didn't want to have that connection with him, but because I didn't feel confident in myself. And so it's really interesting for me to hear you talk about these women who are having you know, photographs taken by you, saying that after they had those photos, they started having intimate relationships with their partners again. And it just goes to show psychologically how important it is to talk about our bodies changing, being different. Because what we see in Instagram or in these magazines, it's not realistic. It's not real. I mean, even then, they're photoshopped. What you do is wonderful. Um, I was talking with Kate earlier this evening, and we we were scouring through trying to find some statistics to throw out to everyone tonight. And one of the things that I found that was very um, disturbing was the topic of sexuality and motherhood in general. It's really hard to find anything on it. Um, there was a study done by Bridgewater State University back in 2014 that scoured through eight of the biggest parenting and motherhood magazines in the United States. They scanned through over 14,746 articles. Of all of those articles, only 2.3% talked about sexuality. That's it, 2.3%. Um, and it's funny because when you think about sex and motherhood, you, you think about some negative stereotypes. So like for you, Kate, when you've heard about sexuality and motherhood, what are, what are some of the things that come to your mind? Like what do you typically hear? Um, I honestly, it's never really come up. Um, simply because so many women lose their identity of being a woman once they become a mother. They almost shed their, um, their other identities of being a career woman or being um, a woman herself. Um, when they become a mom, their entire identity is wrapped around motherhood. And, and a lot of women allow that to happen 
um, and then struggle to find um, their sexuality and get in touch with their sexuality again. Um, I know I did um, after I became a mom, I wanted nothing to do with anything with my husband's. Um, and then after my second divorce, I actually had a boudoir shoot done with the female who I still speak to today. Mind you, this was five years ago now. Um, but I still speak to her today um, because like you, Lisa, she was able to um, open that door for me and build that rapport with me um, to help me get in touch with my identity as a woman. Um, but I struggled a lot with body issues um, as well as feelings of like guilt and failure and an inability to do it all. Um, like we see so often that mothers have to do, we have to be all of these things. And if we're not, we're faulted for it. You're all of these things, but sexual. Once you become sexual, you have loose morals, or there's some weird, you know, connotation that goes along with it. And that's what we are exactly trying to break here. Now with you, Katie, so you've been married for a while too. Over the years, how have you dealt with getting older, being married, maintaining that spark and that self-love? I honestly think one, because they, you know, we have husbands that are gone a lot. So it's like they come home and you get that butterfly feeling again where you've missed them and you've had to send videos and pictures over to them and pray to God that that shit doesn't go viral. Um, but I think, I don't know, I feel like we do a really good job. I'm like, my thing is, is like, we, you need to have sex at least three days a week. Like, that's my, like, goal. I won't, some days I want to turn it down because I feel like I have the higher sex drive out of the two of us. But now I feel like we're changing. And I don't know if that's a totally different thing, like in our age, if I'm going through menopause or something, but like, I feel like my sex drive's going down and he's like harassing me. And I'm like, fuck, all right. There is no like, way you're going through menopause. You're like 20 something. I'm 36. <laughs> okay, I'm you look 20 something. <laughs> well, go, thank God. No, but I'm serious. And so like, and my thing is, is like, I want to keep that part of our marriage, like football and sex. I'm like, gotta have it. Gotta I think you it. might have the like, perfect marriage, football and sex. Yes. <laughs> and we don't want any more kids. I'm like, Oh, perfect. But it is, it's hard. Like some days it's just like, Oh shit. Like, but then the other days I'm like, no, I'm like, cause he's going to leave again and he'll be gone for nine months. I'm like, you think you're gonna have nine months and having to use your old handy dandy vibrator to keep it busy for nine months like fuck i'm so no. happy you brought that up katie so well i mean masturbation like, using toys 84 percent 84 percent of mothers use self-pleasure as a tool of self-love but that's I'm awesome. 84 I'm pretty I'm sure we pretty much all are. I mean, <laughs> here's the thing, though. When it comes to motherhood, that's also something that's never talked about. It is normal. It is normal. 84% of mothers. Prior to 84%, guess what the statistic states? It's 96. You have this large percentage of the population who are, and I'm saying the words, and I'm sure I'm already turning some people off from the podcast right now, but I'm going to say it again, masturbate. <laughs> and it's, it's normal. <laughs> it is completely normal for several reasons. For one, it not only releases endorphins in your brain, which can help with postpartum depression, but also it helps relieve stress. And oh, stress in motherhood, yeah. Stress in motherhood is, is a huge indication of your mental health. Well, stress and single motherhood, I can't imagine my stress level if I didn't masturbate because working full time, doing the mom thing alone, going to school full time, doing the podcasts, web pages with you guys, and taking on a second job here soon, possibly, it's... My, my stress levels are through the roof right now. So without it, 
nope, I need it. It's a coping skill. It really is. And you know what? For some reason for guys, it's normalized. For young women, maybe a little more normalized. But across the board, you never hear about it with motherhood. It's it's really not normal for moms, for women, actually. Because I get, I bet, I'm just going to ask, did any of you guys ever have somebody talk to you when you were a teenager about masturbating? No. 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 And, so, and so like, one of my, yeah, one of my girlfriends said this to me the other day. She was like, you know, we, we already know that, I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent here. Love you. Thank you for letting me do this. We already know that teenagers want to have sex, right? But we don't want them to have sex. Okay. So we want, we know teenagers want to have sex. So why, why wouldn't you encourage them to masturbate? You know? And so there's, I'm like that, that's brilliant. That makes perfect sense. Why are we not talking to teenagers about masturbating? If we know that their bodies want to have sex and we don't want them to have, you know, teen pregnancies or whatnot. Why are we not talking to girls about masturbation? And I was like, she said that. And I was like, you are so right. I haven't even thought yeah. about that. I mean, That's even for right. something that is just women specific, like periods, menstrual cycles, mm -hmm. that's also something that gets hidden in the background. It's yeah. like, we have to be ashamed of it. I remember my mom talking with me about periods and I was so mortified. I was mortified and I felt like I had to hide everything. I mean, even something as stupid as opening the, the pad wrapper, I'm like, it's so loud. Everyone's going to know. <laughs> you know? Like everyone will know right now that I'm bleeding. And then, and, and then you, you put it in the trash can, but like put a lot of toilet paper over it so they don't see you so yeah. still in the trash after you leave. <laughs> oh my gosh. And it's like, everyone does it, but for some reason. <laughs> you, you can't talk about it. It's just like poop. We can't talk about it. But we should be If you have a vagina, you're going to bleed. Right. When, well, when I was 18, my mother bought me my first vibrator. And it was funny because she, she bought it for me. And, um, and I was about to leave the house to go to my boyfriend's house. So she, she's like, hey, set me down. I want to, I bought you something, you know, whatever. So she gives it to me and I'm like, oh, um, cool, awkward, whatever. And I go to my friend, grab my purse and I go to walk out the door. She goes, wait a second, let me see your purse. Make sure it's not in there. You shouldn't want me using it like with him, right? What are you talking about, ma? <laughs> she looks at my purse. It's not there. It's all good. It was in my room. But oh my gosh, that was so awkward for me. I mean, my mom and I could talk about anything now, but that was so awkward for me because none of those conversations came about. And they should have. See, and so here, here's a question I want to shoot back to Lisa. So Lisa, you got girls. Um, how are you going to approach this conversation? I'm just curious. <laughs> I see. I only have a boy, and I know Katie. Katie only has a boy too. So, as girl mom, we only have to worry about one penis. Yeah. So, Lisa, how how are you going to have this conversation with your girls, talking about their body and self love? I think this is really important to add into the conversation as well, because there's going to be listeners out there who are in the same boat, whose daughters are older, and they're right there at that cusp. Yeah. Well, so it's hard to say um, exactly how I'm going to handle it because I have some time, but I feel like in my own way, I'm trying to already work on that in the sense of all three of my kids, my son included, they know what boudoir is. They know that I take pictures of women, of moms, of our friends. They know um, I have my own pictures up. Um, and I'm just kind of, my, my goal is to normalize the body in general. And that's a big push that I have with my, my clients as well is put these pictures up. Like, why should your kids be idolizing people they don't know? They should be idolizing you. And, um, that's a huge part that I think is so important. You know, your kids are going to see people half naked all the time, even when they just go to the beach. I mean, 
Hawaii, <laughs> it was, you know, nobody's has clothes on. And so why should you, why shouldn't they see you in that same way? Um, so that's huge. That's a big thing with my girls for sure. But honestly, I will tell you, I will probably have someone in my family mostly talk to my girls about sex. And I'll tell you why, because I have a great relationship with my mom. She will listen to this podcast. I guarantee you. And there's no way I would have talked to her about sex in high school because I did not want to be prevented from having sex in high school, if that makes sense. So the idea of talking to her about it made me worry that my time with my boyfriend, who is now my husband, would have been taken away. Um, I was worried that because there was so many chances that we had that we were alone, I was worried that would be taken away or that things would become more strict, or somebody would always have to be with us when we were doing something. So it had nothing to do with my mom. It had to do with me not wanting things to change. And so, um, like, I already had, like, the sex talk with my niece, who my, I know that, like, my sister and her aren't doing that yet. So I was like, do you know what an STD is? Let me tell you. <laughs> and so we, we went down, so I went down that road with her. So I, I'm, as much as I want my girls to, you know, have a lot of self-love and, and uh, love their body for exactly the way it was made and all of those things, um, I think the, I think I'm going to really rely on some of my girl power friends to help with the sex talks because I think that they will be more receptive to hearing somebody other than mom, which I just, I just think will be the biggest thing. And, and so normalizing bodies so that women can pull their, their friends, daughters aside and talk to them about it. I think it's going to be huge for all of us. They say it takes the village to raise a child. You know? It really does. I really like what you just said, Lisa, because I had never thought about having this conversation with my kids. And the points that you brought up were very valid. Um, I think that I would have felt the exact same way when talking to my mom. Granted, she's one of my best friends now. I can tell absolutely anything. The mom's we can job. talk about everything. Um, and she supports me no matter what, no questions asked. Um, but I think that I would have reacted the same way uh, tried to bring that up to me when I was younger. And having two girls now, I, um, one of my best friends, um, I would absolutely trust her to have this conversation with my kids for me. Um, I could be present, be present if it makes them more comfortable, but they absolutely, I love her too. She's got two girls of her own and a little boy. Um, so I, I really like your point of, of having a friend do it for you. Um, not as a cop out, but as a as a way for your child to feel more comfortable and maybe more open, less judged. Yes, and and it can be an addition, an addition to whatever you're going to be talking to them about too. Um, I'm definitely not saying don't talk to them, but I do think that there is something to be said for someone else getting maybe more out of your child in that comfort, just because you are mom. And so I think that that. I think having, uh, you know, like you said, a, a, it takes a village to raise a child. Having people help you in that is so important. I agree. It uh, also can you guys hear me? I can hear you. So okay, to our first viewers, Nikki has like three little ones at home. And then she's got her in-laws over and her husband all in the background. So like she's been a super trooper, but... <laughs> with us throughout the show um yeah that's but that's motherhood that's life it's unpredictable it's messy well my my it's phone died happen. oh and my yeah and your took phone the charger died. out of here <laughs> so i had to run to get the charger and then my six month old saw me and started crying so I gotta love mom life well all of the husbands are screwing up lately they really are. Chargers, losing wine bottle openers. This is crazy. Throw the husbands out. I know. Mine's gone for a week, so I'm good. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Mine's upstairs playing video games right now. I divorced mine. I divorced mine. Mine are gone, gone. <laughs> Can you guys hear me now? Bottle. 
Yes. Yep. Yep. You can hear you My mom fine. started calling me. So that's, Danny, that was no. <laughs> Tell Sandy to call you later. Um, so no. No. with that being said, ladies, so we are getting ready to wrap this up. And I am so excited because we are opening up the conversation, talking about things like feeling confident in your body, intimacy and relationship, and then, oh my gosh, you know, say it louder for them again. I'm making more people blush. I'm making more people blush. Um, but really, where this conversation is going to take off is by having other people engage. You know, it's not just listening to the podcast, it's not just clicking on photos of other people, it's having conversations, particularly with your friends. Um, since I turned 30, I started having a lot more conversations about my body and about sex and my sex life um, with, with those around me. And honestly, that has helped me tremendously because it has shown me that I'm not alone in a lot of the ways that I'm feeling. So for all of our viewers out there, I want you to engage in the conversation with us. Post um, comments on the video thread and let us know what you think. Um, that's really how we're going to remove the taboo and the negative stigma. So with each of my co-hosts that I have here tonight, I'm going to offer them some closing remarks. Welcome, thank you. So for Kate, um, thank you so much for co-hosting with us tonight. And uh, what, are, what are your closing remarks for our segment? First off, thank you guys for listening. Sorry, <laughs> um, I was muted for a second. Um, thank you guys all for listening and for you ladies for joining. Um, I did want to just make a couple of points that there have been a few studies um, that really show um, the more the, the perception that the public has on women who um, are in touch with their sexuality, and a lot of them say that the more sexual a woman is perceived to be the less she is seen as a good mother. We need to destroy that statement. We need to make sure that that statement doesn't hold true. Um, we've, as a society, we kind of have already started. Um, I mean, in the 80s, there were movies that started to star strong female leads. Um, and since then, it has really, um, those female leads have gone into roles where their characters are more in touch with their sexuality. So it's actually becoming a really big talking point now, um, though there aren't many studies and surveys that, um, that reflect this, but as a society ourselves, we need to make sure that we are, as women, in touch with our sexuality and destroying these things, um, putting away the guilt and the, the failure and the pressures of having to do it all. And the views of others and how they impact our self-esteem, our self-worth, or even our self-image. Like we need to make sure that we are finding that validation within ourselves and promoting our own sexuality, not being afraid to, to break those barriers. Right. I couldn't agree more. We are our, our own worst enemy when it comes to judgment among mothers, and we are going to be the catalyst that actually breaks through and normalizes this so we get more women in engaging in the conversation. So couldn't agree more. Um, Katie, our fellow co-host, what are your, your parting words of wisdom for this evening? Your final thoughts? Get out there and get yourself a vibrator, ladies. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, no, we do. 15% off through Adam and you. Woo, I'm doing this. But, yes, you you know, so right now. Now. <laughs> get that, I'm get the Fem on Fun. That. The Fem Fun one is really a fun. a vibrator for your uh, stocking. Um, have at it, girls. Oh, and so yes, fun. Adam and Eve also has this like we vibe where you can sync it up to your phone and then your partner who is, I don't know, deployed maybe, can control it himself with his phone. Oh, as hell as no. You. Perfect. <laughs> I'll never sleep. <laughs> I'll be in the grocery store and Randy was trying doing some shit. <laughs> Add it to the laundry routine. Real fun. Real fun, guys. <laughs> oh. Some Christian Grey shit right there. Oh, my goodness. Nikki, are you still with us, or have your children taken you over? 
Um, I'm still with you, but it's, I don't know if you can hear me. It, I we can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, okay. What are your parting thoughts for tonight? Um, I don't know. <laughs> It's okay. I don't know. I wasn't prepared for that question. I don't know. I was just listening because I was out for most of the conversation or not most of it, but yeah, I, yeah, my phone died. And then see, Nikki has a baby at home. So I was just like breastfeeding her a second. <laughs> Help, but you know what? That's a good parting word to have normalizing breastfeeding. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. The breasts are yes. not sexual. When you, when you are breastfeeding, it is normal. <laughs> that's actually a huge thing. Um, yes. I was going to say about that. That's like a really big stigma. P or women have been so over-sexualized in our, especially in the Western culture, that the very thought of seeing a woman's breast, other women get offended or insecure about it. And it's insane to me. Um, it's absolutely normal. It's not a sexual function part of your body it's for feeding your babies and that's what they were created for and it blows my mind that people don't know that see but that's the other thing too like i said we can be our own worst enemy or we could be our biggest advocates so as women normalizing yep. feeding normalizing the body we can empower each other we we truly can but actions are going to speak louder than just words so you know what you breastfeed girl i'm proud of you yep and then lastly, I'm going to have our parting words for our guest host tonight. Um, Lisa, you have been wonderful. And we absolutely adore all the work that you do for women everywhere, not even just mothers. Um, you have done so much to not only normalize the human body, whether it be man, woman, but also to empower women to take back their sexuality and to normalize it and create a healthy image for younger women who are going through the initial stages of discovering their bodies and finding who they are. Um, so with that, um, I would like for you to explain a new project that you are working on and I'm pretty excited about, and then we will end with you for tonight. Um, thank you, and thanks so much for having me on the show. I hope to come back again because all of these things are super passionate topics of mine. Um, I will say I, I wanted to circle back really quick and just say, because you had asked me, what would I tell moms who are too scared to book a session, um, a boudoir session? And I never touched on that. And I just, I would go back to the fact that everybody is scared. Everybody is scared to do it jumping in. Um, so you just got to do it and, um, feel free to reach out. We're all in different states. I mean, yes, come to Seattle and come to my boudoir room and I will rock your socks off or find a boudoir photographer in your area and talk to them and they will pump you up too. But, um, what Whitney was talking about is I'm launching a brand new company and it is called the Naked Society and it is all about body empowerment. Um, women, men, um, I launched my first two shirts already and they, uh, one says the naked society and the other says get naked and there'll be a lot of different things on there, um, but I'm super pumped about it because it's also all the products are going to be giving back to the house, which is a local nonprofit organization that helps, um, homeless teenagers and homeless teenagers with babies and all that horrible stuff. So, um, I'm super excited about that. And um, in general, like my closing thoughts, you know, you guys were just bringing up breastfeeding. And I would say, like, I tell people, I'm super passionate about what the woman body can do. I'm passionate about what you can do with before. I'm passionate about breastfeeding, being pregnant, birth, all of those things, and normalizing all of those things. Normalizing birth, normalizing feeding the baby. Um, super passionate about all of those things. So, um, you guys, if you are not feeling the support you need in those categories, you need to find your community. I don't like to use the word tribe because some people don't love that word and that's okay. So I try to say, find your community, find your people. If you are not being supported by the people who are around you, you need to surround yourself with other people because there is an 
endless network of women out there that will support you through your journey and you need to find them. Heck yeah, and that's the other thing too. You gotta find your community for women who make you feel good about yourself. Couldn't agree more. So to all of my drinking mommies here tonight, we really appreciate you joining us for our flagship podcast. Um, we are going to have a weekly show where we are going to take on controversial topics every week. And they're only controversial because, you know what, people just don't want to talk about them. But we are all about normalizing. We are normalizing things that, honestly, we need to talk about because it's good for mental health. It's good for mental health. It's just a general education. So to all of you, thank you for your support. We look forward to seeing you for next week. We'll be announcing our show topic on Wednesday. So all my co-hosts, thank you so much for joining me this evening. It has been an absolute pleasure to be with each and every one of you ladies. Have a good night. Cheers.